This morning, we're going to start a brand new sermon series. I'm going to ask you to pull out your, your phone or your Bible and, and turn in at uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, we're going to read just the first four verses. This is what John says. He says, in the beginning was the word. Now he's going to use that word, word, a lot in this word. And uh, what you need to know is that the word for word is not word, but it's actually the word logos, which is where we get our word logic. So really what, what John is saying is, is in the beginning was logic. But he means something specific by it, which we'll get to eventually. But in the beginning was the Word, or the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, or that Logos, was with God in the beginning. And through him, or that Logos, all things were made, and without him, that Logos, nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Last, uh, I want to say last week, but none of us were here last week. Two weeks ago, if you were here, you may remember, we talked about what living in light of the resurrection looks like. It was the first week after Easter, and we talked about um, Peter's letter that he wrote, probably from prison, to churches and Christians uh, meeting in different places throughout the Roman Empire. And what we learned was that people who live in light of the resurrection have a particular mindset. They think it's a certain way. They have a mission, and they have a motivation. The mindset remember was to be all committed to the same thing to following Jesus even though we're all different the, that our mindset leads us to be sympathetic humble, loving, compassionate and that whole mindset leads to our mission which is to love people, to bless people whether they deserve it or not that people who live in light of the resurrection people who follow Jesus are people who, who don't repay evil for evil who don't repay insult for insult but they repay evil with blessing and, and the motivation be for all of that we remember was twofold. The first piece of it was Peter said, Look, if you live this way, if you live to, to love others, to be sympathetic, to be compassionate, to bless people whether they deserve it or not, if you live this way, it's a life that you will love. So, motivation number one, you want to love your life, then live this way. Motivation number two, that's the kind of life that God is actually all about. He is all about people, He is all about a life that blesses those who don't deserve it, a life that is humble, loving, compassionate, and sympathetic. And the reason we know that that's true is because Jesus was the ultimate example of those things. Jesus was the ultimate example of what it looked like to be humble, to be loving, to be compassionate, to be sympathetic. Jesus was the ultimate example of what it looked like to bless people even though they don't deserve it. And that's kind of where we stopped. That was verse 12 in 1 Peter. But if you keep reading, if you read to verse 13, 14, and 15, what you find out is that Peter actually says, and you can check this if you want to later, Peter actually says after that, if you live this way, understand that if, if you live with this mindset and this mission, this motivation, people are going to wonder what's up with you. People are going to wonder why you are the way that you are. Why do you bless people who don't deserve it? Do you realize the way they're treating you and yet you still bless them? Why do you do that? Peter says you... Why, people are going to ask you why you have the hope that you have in life. Why do you believe what you believe? And in verse 15, he says something very, he gives an instruction, very interesting. He says, you need to be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. Be ready to give an answer. Because people have questions. And so the, the question that I kind of want to sit on with us for the next couple of weeks together is, are you ready to give an answer? Are you ready to give an answer for the questions, the objections, the doubts that people have for the Christian faith? And so over the course of the next couple of weeks, what we're going to do together is we're going to sit and talk about, we're going to spend time thinking about and reflecting on some of those questions and objections and doubts that people have, maybe that, that you have, about the Christian faith. Because here's what I know is true. I know that some of you wonder, 
I know that some of you have friends, family members, coworkers, neighbors, loved ones who wonder, who aren't quite ready maybe to say, I- I'm done with the whole church thing altogether. Maybe you are you got your hand on the doorknob though. And if we sat and had coffee and I, I pushed you enough, you'd say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to give up on the whole thing, but I, I'm not sure I believe it 100%. I still have questions. Maybe your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors, the ones who are not here this morning, are not here because they have questions, objections, and doubts to the Christian faith. For for whatever reason, Christianity has, for a lot of people, lost its appeal. It's, It's lost its hope. And people have questions. Like, like, doesn't science disprove the Bible? Isn't the Bible kind of regressive and, and, well, historically inaccurate? And can we really trust what it says historically? Isn't the Bible culturally, culturally irrelevant, actually a little bit offensive? How can you believe in a good God when, when there's so much evil and suffering in the world? How can you believe in a, in a book that talks about miracles, which by, the, by definition are things that are impossible? How could you believe in a, in a faith that, that, well, that houses some of the most egregious atrocities done in history? I mean, the church is responsible for some, doing some of the worst things in, in history. How, how could that faith be true? Why aren't Christians better people? I mean, if, if their faith is real, if the Holy Spirit that they talk about is real, it, shouldn't Christians be better people than they actually are? And the questions go on and on. And so my hope throughout this series is that what we can do together is we can sit here and we're going to put our faith that we just spoke together in the Apostles' Creed, that we just sang about and prayed about, that we're going to put, we're going to put it on trial. We're going to put our faith on trial and we're going to ask the hard questions of it. And my hope is, is that you can walk away from this not thinking to yourself, um... I've got arguments. I don't want to give you a binder. Like, I don't know if you've ever had a telemarketer call and I give you a binder of all the answers. Like, like you say this and then if they come back with this, turn to page 34 in your binder and then you say this and then if they say respond this way, then you turn to 267 in your binder and try to keep up. That's not my hope. I'm not trying to give you a script for an argument. I want to honestly sit together and, and think about some of the tough questions that people have asked about Christianity, that people have asked about faith in God. I want to put faith on trial. My hope is that if you're the kind of person who says to yourself, you know what, I, I want to believe, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure about this, this, and this, then I hope that in the next couple of weeks you can get some of the answers that you've been looking for. And if you are a Christian and you are totally bought into this whole, the whole faith thing, my hope is that by the end of this discussion, you will be on your way to being ready to give, to give an answer. Because people will ask, if you live it out, why do you believe what you believe? Why believe in God? So, before I ever went to school and started the journey to becoming a pastor, before I ever became a pastor, I worked in a grocery store for a little over 10 years. I started when I was 13 years old. And one of my favorite people to work with was a a young guy named Ben. I liked Ben. He was bright. He was funny. He was a university student, local university, studying business administration. Uh, Ben and I would talk and jab each other and joke around in the the store all the time as we stocked shelves and and had a common conversation on a regular basis. We'd be stocking shelves and Ben would say something from the other side of the aisle. Hey, Corey, can you work for me on Sunday morning? He knew the answer, but he'd ask me anyway because he wanted to get to his, his, his jabbing. Ben would ask me, Corey, can you work for me on Sunday morning? I'd say, Ben, you know, I can't, I can't work for you on Sunday morning. I'm, I'm going to church. You know that. And he would immediately launch into the questions. He'd be like, why? Why on earth would you go to church? Why on earth would you believe in God? Why would you believe in something that you can't see, you can't touch, you can't actually feel? Why would you be one of those people? And then he would stand in the middle of the aisle with his hands out like this. And he'd say, let's test your God. And in between deodorant and paper towels, he would say, God, if you are real, strike me dead. And then he'd hold his arms out like this. And then he'd smile at me and say, that's what I thought. 
no God. And we'd go back to working and we'd laugh because the truth is he knew as well as I did that that's not exactly an airtight argument against the existence of God. But the argument's not the point. The question is the point. Why, why believe in God? Why? People, most people, in most cultures, throughout most of history, have believed in God. Why? Plato, who walked, not like like, uh, the clay, but like Plato, the person, the philosopher, walked the earth 400 years before Christ, before Jesus ever stepped foot on this planet. Plato said, there's two things that lead people to believe in God. It's the movement of the stars and the existence of the soul or the conscience. 2,200 years later... In the 1700s, a man named Immanuel Kant said, there are two things that lead a person to believe in God. It's the starry hosts above and the moral law within, which was his poetic way of saying, it's the study of what is in creation and the universe and the fact that every single one of us seems to know intuitively inside of us that there is a right and there is a wrong way to live as a human being. Alvin Plantinga, who's a modern day philosopher, okay, so we've gone 400 years before Christ, 1700s, Alvin Plantinga is still living today, he just got a fantastic award. He says that there are 20 arguments for God's existence. Number one. No, just kidding. Uh, He says there are 20 arguments for God's existence that are pretty good, but they really all boil down to two, which is the fact that there is something rather than nothing, the fact that we, we, we exist, and that we all seem to know that there's right and wrong. There are these two things that throughout history, throughout cultures, throughout most people's lives have led them to believe that there is something out there, that God exists, that there is a God. Tim Keller, who's a pastor in, in New York City, says that, that these things are not proofs for God's existence, but they're, they're more like fingerprints. You know, like at a crime scene, when, when the, the police go to a crime scene after to investigate what happened there, they, they dust for fingerprints maybe. And if they find fingerprints, it's not exactly a proof for who did the crime, but it certainly does point back to who might have done it. Fingerprints like the idea of contingency. Now, that's just a big fancy word that means cause. Everything that exists was caused by something else. You exist. You were caused by something else. Your mom and dad or your biological parents got together and now you exist and that's all I'm going to explain about that. This chair exists because it was caused by something else. It was, it was a tree at one point, and then somebody cut that tree down, and, and they used the wood to make this chair. Everything that exists was caused by something else. Now, before there was a tree, there was probably a seed. And before that seed was a seed, it was probably f- caused by something else. It came from uh, maybe a pine cone or, or whatever this is made out of. I don't know for sure. And you think, what does this have to do with God? Well, it's like a domino. If you push the dominoes and they fall over, every single domino that fell over was pushed over by another domino. Every single one had a cause for why it fell. What does this have to do with God? Well, at some point, when you go back far enough, you were caused by this, which was 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 caused by this. At some some point, you have to get to a place where there was a first domino. And dominoes don't fall by themselves. They fall because the table is shaky, or they fall because someone or something pushed the first one. There had to be a a beginning. Something that wasn't a domino had to set up the domino. Something that wasn't a domino had to be the first domino pusher. In 1929, 
a man named Edwin Hubble. If you're thinking Hubble Telescope, you're right. It was named after him. A man named Edwin Hubble made a really interesting observation through his telescope. He figured out that it looks like the stars, the solar system, the sun, the moon, everything seems to be moving around, which was not new. Everybody thought that the sun, the moon, the stars, that, that but at that point, everything was moving around. But what he saw was something brand new. He noticed that it wasn't just the sun, moon, stars, solar systems that were moving around, but the very fabric of space, the universe itself, seemed to be moving outward as though it had kind of exploded from a, a single point. Now, the reason this is interesting is because up until this point, everybody kind of believed that the universe was eternal. It's sort of like a big bowl, and all the planets and all the solar systems just existed in this big bowl, and they came into existence, and they came out of existence, but the bowl itself never changed. But what Hubble figured out was that the bowl actually wasn't eternal. It had a beginning. It, it was like it had exploded from a single point. Which, by the way, is where the, the theory of the Big Bang came from. That, that everything that exists had, had at one point, the universe and everything within it at one point, was just a single point. And before that point, there was nothing. Then there was that point, that something, and then everything. Now... Whether or not you think the Big Bang is, is real or not real, it is not really the point. The point is, at that moment, Genesis 1 starts to not sound so ridiculous. That at some point there was an in the beginning. And perhaps a, a beginning with a flash of light. Now... The argument says that if there is something rather than nothing, someone or something had to have started that something. Somebody had to be the first one to push the domino to get the whole thing started. Francis Collins, who is a scientist who headed up the Human Genome Project, which is this crazy project where they figured out everything there is to know about your DNA, like the instructions, the biological instructions that make you you. They figured out the whole thing. They mapped the whole thing out. This massive project, including all kinds of scientists. Francis Collins was on that team. He headed up that team. He was an atheist, became a Christian. He says... The idea of the Big Bang cries out for divine explanation. It cries out for divine explanation. Now, what do we care about what he says? He's a Christian. Of course he believes in God. Stephen Hawking, who was a celebrated atheist, celebrated mathematician and astronomer, just passed away a couple of weeks ago, said that if the Big Bang is true... It has religious implications. Something doesn't come from nothing. There had to be a first domino pusher. I, I, I'm not trying to tell you that the Big Bang is true. All I'm trying to tell you is that if there was a beginning, there had to be somebody who started it. That's one of the fingerprints that has led people throughout history to believe in the existence of God. But it's not just that there's something rather than nothing. It's not just that there was something, but, but it's the complexity of that something. If you think about how complex you are as a human being, if you think about all of how your body works together, it's so complex, it, it, it could not have happened. People have thought for centuries, it could not have happened by accident. A, a guy named Will, we'll just leave it at that, it's not really important, William Paley, but a guy named Will said in 17, uh, 18th century, he, he put it this way. He says, sort of like if you were walking on the beach and you found a, a, uh, a piece of driftwood. Now, you could come up with natural explanations, time, wind, rain, storms, for how that piece of driftwood got there, right? Maybe at some point, lightning struck a tree and the wind blew and the tree cracked, branch cracked off and, and then it went into the water and over time, the leaves kind of molded off and fell off and then the beating of the water against this twig or branch in, in, the, in the water, the beating of it eventually wore all the, all the bark off of it and it, it got a whole bunch smoother and then eventually it floated up on shore. It's pretty easy to imagine some kind of natural explanation for that. But then he, William says, but what if you kept walking along the beach and you saw a pocket watch? 
You, pro you can't think to yourself, ah, at some point, lightning struck a pocket watch tree, and then the pocket watch fell off of the tree and into the water and eventually floated up. But no, that doesn't make any sense. No, it's too complex. It's not just the fact that there's something rather than nothing. It's the complexity of that something that has led people throughout history to believe that there's a God. Francis, again, in his study of creation, said even some of the simplest amoebas have enough genetic coding and information in them to fill 30 encyclopedias. I think about if, you, if, if you've ever gotten stuck talking to Alana. I mean, if you've ever had the privilege of talking to Alana about, sorry, uh, uh, I'm going to hear about that later. <laughs> had the privilege, I know some of you have, of talking to her after Sunday morning worship service about some of the research that she does on those little flatworms. I mean, these things are just so small and they seem so ins insignificant. But the complexity of those things, I mean, people have been studying them for years. People have written papers and papers and papers and papers. She reads papers and papers. She writes research and papers about these little worms that are so complex. So complex. So, the number one reason that has led people throughout history to believe that there is a God is, is that there's something rather than nothing and the complexity of that something People have believed it just couldn't have happened by accident. I don't think it could have happened by accident. There, there had to have been somebody who pushed the first dominoes. There had to have been somebody who set up the dominoes in the first place. Now, I know that in recent history, especially in North America, there has at times been a lot of tension between the church and the scientific community. Or, or on a popular level, there, there's been this idea that faith and science are opposed to each other. This is simply not true. It's not true. At times, it's caused a, a tension and, and arguments and upheaval within the church, and it's, it's, un, it's unnecessary. There's a lot of fear around the idea that if, if we start pursuing science, that, that somehow we will stop believing in God. It's not true. It's, it's a mistake. Let me explain to you what I mean. Can I borrow this? I, I got this illustration from someone else before you think that I'm super smart um, or think it's a terrible illustration. It's not mine. Um, this is an iPhone 7, 8. 7, 8, 7, 8. It, this is an iPhone. If we got together and decided we're going to study this iPhone, we're going to figure out everything that makes it. That's a really nice family picture. <laughs> Uh, we're going to figure out everything that, that works in this phone. We're going to figure out how all the electronics work. We're going to figure about how all the transistors and, and all of the, the motherboards. I don't know. Everything inside of this phone, we're going to figure out how it works, how it's made. We're going to learn everything there is to learn about this phone. And once we knew everything, we knew absolutely everything, we could build our own phone. We know everything there is to know about the phone. Would you then in the end go... No one designed it. Nobody made it. No, that, that's, not, that's not a logical jump. I, instead, you know what it does for me? It makes me say, and this is just me, I don't, you don't have to think like me, but it makes me kind of be in wonder and awe at the person who, who made this, who designed this, this phone, especially given its complexity. The number one reason why people have believed in God throughout history is the movement of the stars. It's the study of, of creation. It's really kind of science itself that has pointed to God's existence throughout history. Reason number two, and I promise this one will be shorter. Reason number two, Plato said the soul, right? Kant said the moral law within. C.S. Lewis, anybody read the Narnias, the Narnia books? Maybe you've seen the movie, right? Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. C.S. Lewis uh, was an atheist and a professor at Oxford University. He became a Christian. And the, the, the thing that opened him up to the idea of the existence of God, do you know what it was? It was while he was standing in line waiting for something, like maybe to pay at a cash register for something, and someone cut in front a few people ahead, and everybody got mad about it. And now he's a Christian. No. <laughs> See how easy it is? We should just say amen, and then that's it. No. Somebody cut in line, and everybody was mad about it. 
everybody was upset about it. Nobody taught you to be upset about the fact that somebody cut in line. No one taught you that, that it's wrong to cut in front of... We, we seem to just know intuitively, uh, Lewis says. What is that thing that's inside of us that, that says that there's a right way and a wrong way to stand in line? More than that, what's, what's that thing inside of us that says there's a right way and there's a wrong way to live your life? There's a right way and there is a wrong way to be a human being. Lewis says it seems like it's, it's separate from what we, what we want, our preferences. It's not just that like we want to not have people cut in front, although we do, but like what, what is it about us that knows the difference between right and wrong? Why do we all know that it's wrong to napalm babies? Why do we all know that it's wrong to, to starve the poor? Why do we all know that it's, it's just wrong as a society to, to just let those who are sick and weak die? Why do we know that? There's something inside of us that says that there's a right and a wrong way. Now listen, what Lewis figured out, what many people have, have decided, was that really what, there's this universal moral law that we all try to live up to. There's a standard for how to operate as a human being. Now, we might disagree about what that standard actually is. We might disagree about everything that's included in that standard, but we all agree there is a standard. There is a way that people should live their lives and there is a way that they should not live their lives. The reason I know this is true is I've read a comment section on a Facebook article. Everyone seems to know that there is a right and a wrong way to live. Now, there are two major objections to this, major questions about this, one of which you know and you probably experience because lots of people think this way, and the, the other is not well known, um, and I, I could get into it being true, but it just simply doesn't work. The first objection is this. There is no universal rule for how human beings ought to operate. We all just figure it out for ourselves. Steph should be able to figure out for herself what, what is right and what is wrong, and, and I should be able to figure out for myself what's right and what's wrong. And, and you do you, and I'll do me, and, and that's how we'll live our lives. That's a very kind of a popular way to think, right? As, as long as I don't bump into you and you don't bump into me, morality is just relative to whatever you think is good and bad. Here's why that doesn't quite work, although that would be really nice if it was true. Um, it doesn't work because no one lives that way. It doesn't work because we are all outraged by everything all the time. That's how I know it's not true. You see, let's say Steph thinks that, that women ought to have equal rights, that women ought to be treated with dignity and respect, that they ought to receive equal pay, that they ought to be free to get an education and a job and all the rest. And I don't think so. Let's imagine, let's imagine, that I, d I don't think women should drive. I don't think women should be able to get a job. I don't think that. Now, should, shouldn't somebody be able to tell me I'm wrong? Right? Something inside you says, Corey, that's not right. That's not right. The problem is if, if we say, you figure out what works for you, I'll figure out what works for me, what works for me is going to start limiting you. Right? What works for me is definitely going to be bumping into you. And, and if you're upset by the way that I live my life, I, I would ask the question, based on what standard? If we all get to determine our own standard, there's no way we can hold each other accountable. There's no way that we can look at the world and say, that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Women ought to be treated better. They ought to be able to drive. They ought to be able to get a job. If we take away a universal rule that we all try to adhere to, we take away justice. We take away human dignity. We take away treating one another properly because there is no proper. It's just whatever you decide. So it doesn't quite work. And it's, it really doesn't take long to figure out that it doesn't quite work. You know that intuitively. Second objection is, is simply this. Well, okay, there is a universal law, but we don't need a God to have a universal law. 
we as the human race have figured out as we've grown, as we've evolved, as, as we've progressed throughout history, we figured out what's best for human beings to thrive and survive or to survive and thrive. We've just figured it out over time. We've, we've developed a universal law. Now, again, good objection, interesting. But if you remove God from the picture, you run into problems. Decide for ourselves, as, as the human race, what's right and what's wrong based on what's best helps us survive and thrive. The question is, then how do you explain some of the things that we do in life? Because we do a lot of things that we say are moral and good and right that don't make sense for our thriving in a natural sense. For example, in the North America, we spend billions of dollars on trying to keep our sick and weak alive in the human race. Nowhere else in nature do you see the kind of resources expended to care for the sick and the weak in society. It is not what's best for us to thrive and survive as a human race to allow the weak to keep straggling behind. But something, in, if I was to suggest, we shouldn't care for sick people. We should let the weaker ones die off. Like, that's, whoa, that, that's dark. That's, that's almost like, that's, that's Hitler-type stuff who determined that, that the Jews in, in, in the 40s were a weaker race. They were a sickness of humanity. They needed to be exterminated. That's, that way of thinking doesn't quite work. Self-sacrifice doesn't make sense for the idea that what's right and what's good is only what helps us survive and thrive. The second and I think bigger issue for us, especially living in a democracy in, in the United States, is when we say we have figured this out, we developed, we sorted out, we evolved to understand what that rule is, what that standard is over time. Who's we? Who's us? If you take God out of the judgment seat, if you remove God as the standard setter, who is the standard setter now? Is it the powerful? Is it the strong? Is it up for a majority vote? Something inside of us says that that's wrong. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It shouldn't work that way. The strong, the powerful, the majority have voted in favor of terrible things throughout history. There's, there's no evidence for that. And, and then I would just kind of go back to the very beginning. If you think to yourself, now that's not quite right. It shouldn't be a majority vote to determine what's right and wrong. What is that thing inside of you that makes you think that? What is that thing that says that there is a right and wrong? Because we all seem to know it. We all seem to know intuitively that there is a right and a wrong way to be a human being. We all seem to know intuitively that, that there is, if you look, if you study, that there is a sort of, well, there is something rather than nothing. That's not hard to figure out. But that there is a complexity to the something rather than the nothing. What is that thing? The ancient Greek philosophers in the first century, and I promise we're going to wrap up soon, the ancient Greek philosophers in the first century called that thing the Logos. It was, it was a logic. There's a logic to the way that your morality works. There's a logic to the inner, the inner conscience, the soul inside of you that says that some things are right and some things are wrong. There's a logic to the complexity and design of, of the universe and creation. There's just a logic driving this. And they believed, the Greek philosophers in the first century believed that the more you lived in line with that logic, that logos, the better your life would go. The more you lived in line with, with that moral rule, that, that principle, with the principle of the design of creation, the better your life would go. The Apostle John, who walked and talked with Jesus, he put it this way. He said, in the beginning was that logic. And everybody who read his book said, yeah, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. The logic that kind of set the design for everything, that pushed it forward, that, that tells us that there's a right and a wrong. He said, in the beginning there was that logic, and the logic was with God. Okay. And the logic was God. Okay. The logic was with God in the beginning. Through the logic, through the logic, all things were made. Everything that has been made was made through that, that principle, that logic. Nothing that exists, exists on its own. It all came from that, that initial logical principle push. And in that logic was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. What's really interesting, and we didn't read it, uh, is that if you skip down to verse 14, if you've got your Bible open, John says, and that logic, that principle, that seems to guide the, the standard for how human beings ought to operate, that seems to tell us that there's a design and a complexity to creation, that principle was a person that that logic actually put on flesh. John says the word was made flesh, the logos was made flesh, and he dwelt among us. So the reason that people have believed in God throughout history is the complexity, the fact that there's something rather than nothing and the complexity of what is here. The fact that we all know that there seems to be a right and a wrong way to live your life as a human being. And John says, that, that thing, that logic inside of you, isn't just a principle. It's a person. And we saw him. We walked with him. We talked with him. We knew God. Because we knew Jesus. So, why trust what John has to say about God? Why trust what... What this book says about God, why I trust the Bible? Great question. That's where we'll go next week. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for revealing yourself in creation. Lord, we thank you for the truth that you have set in place a standard for how human beings ought to operate. But it can kind of be scary when we think about the words that Paul wrote, that we are all held without excuse because you revealed yourself through creation. And so, Lord, more than just the fact that we can know you through those two ways that we talked about this morning, we thank you for the truth that John proclaimed, that we could know you through Jesus. Lord, I pray that, that you would send us out with a growing, bold confidence in your existence, Father. And as we continue to explore some of the questions about why believe whether you exist, why believe the Bible, why believe the Christian faith, Lord, I pray that you would plant the seed within us, that you would move by your spirit within us to assure us not only of your existence, but your love for us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.